Hello everyone and thank you for watching. This is Professor Ryan Paul and you're watching my second part of my narrator's video. Um, this one I've subtitled Form and Content. So our purpose here in this presentation is to review the different narrative perspectives in literature, the different concepts that we talked about in the first narrator's video, and apply those concepts specifically to some of the texts that we've been reading, the short stories we've been reading in class, and consider how the narrative perspective shapes the meaning of the story. The text that we're going to be using, uh, Sunny's Blues, The Jewelry, The Werewolf and the Company of Wolves, and The Ones Who Walk Away from Omelas. And I'll be talking about them in that order after we get our uh, first review. So part one, let's review the major concepts associated with narrators. So remember, the defining attributes of a narrator are the narrator's relationship to the story and the audience, that is, are they part of the story or not, and their level of knowledge or intimacy with the characters. So how do you figure out what the characters, excuse me, what the narrator's relationship to the story or audience is? Well, some questions you can ask yourself. Is the narrator also a character in the story? Do they participate in the events of the story? Does the narrator speak from a personal perspective? And what pronouns does the narrator use? A first person narrator is a part of the story, so they're internal by definition. First person narrator always speaks from a personal perspective. And a first person narrator predominantly uses the first person pronoun, I. So they talk about, I did this, I did that. As, etc. So talking from a first person personal perspective. That defines a first person narrator. Now also this has repercussions for the narrator's level of knowledge. If it's a first person narrator, by necessity they're limited in what they know of other characters. Just like we only know our own thoughts and emotions, a first person narrator can only know their own thoughts and emotions and not the thoughts and emotions of the other characters. It only knows what they say or do or how they look, not what's going on inside. And also, a first-person narrator may not be entirely honest or accurate in the way they report the story. So they may be what we call unreliable. Now let's go to the third-person narrator. What is their relationship to the story or audience? Well, the third person narrator is usually not part of the story. So they are external to the story. And they usually don't speak from a personal perspective. That is, they're not talking about how I feel, what I am doing, what I saw, but only what he, she, they, or it are doing. So it uses the third person to report the story, not the first person perspective. Now, a third person narrator may sometimes express an attitude uh, or ideas, opinions towards the characters and may occasionally use the first person. They may occasionally say, I think this, um, but that's not, a, that's still, a, there's still a third person narrator if they're predominantly using the third person perspective. But this is what we call an intrusive narrator, because even though they're outside of the story, they intrude on it by giving their own comments or thoughts. Now, where third person narrators can get complicated is in their level of knowledge. What do they know about the other characters? While first person, again, is necessarily limited only to their own perspective, a third person narrator may or may not know a lot of different things. So how do you determine their level of knowledge? Ask yourself these questions. Does the narrator report the emotions and or thoughts of the characters? Or do they only report their actions and words? Is there an, a sense of what's going on inside the characters? Or do we just see them from the outside like a camera? And in terms of the characters that it's, if it is reporting their emotions or thoughts, does the narrator report all of the characters or, or most of the characters? Or do they only report the emotions or thoughts of one or a few characters? So what are the different types of third person narrator? Well, there's omniscient, that means literally all knowing. Um, 
the omniscient narrator knows everything. So they know what all the characters are thinking, what they're doing. There's no mysteries to the third person narrator. So they report the emotions or th and thoughts of all, or at least most of the characters, at least the important characters. Omniscient, all knowing. A third person narrator that's limited is limited to the perspective of only one character or a couple characters. So they can report the emotions and thoughts of that one character. They can see inside that one character, but not all the others. So in other words, they're limited to knowledge of one character. They're not omniscient. They don't know all things. They only know some things. And finally, the objective narrator. This is the narrator that doesn't report any of the emotions or thoughts of any of the characters, only what they say, what they do, what they look like, only factual things. So this narrator is like a camera, right? A camera can't see inside, can't tell us what the character's thinking, but it just shows us what they're doing. So this is like a camera or like a news reporter. A news reporter only reports verifiable facts not what someone's thinking or feeling because that's not something that can be accessed. So omniscient, limited, objective, all knowing, knowing some things, only knowing the outside. Now, how do you use these terms? Well, you would use the term first person narrator. You'd call a narrator a first person narrator. Any narrator that predominantly uses I, the first person, and is a character in the story. That is, they're internal to the story. The other modification you might use is you might call a first person narrator unreliable. That's a narrator who predominantly uses I and is a character in the story, but for some reason seems untrustworthy. Maybe they are lying, maybe they're a criminal, maybe they don't know certain things and they're guessing, right? For various reasons, the first person narrator seems to be unreliable, like they're not telling you the entire truth. We would call a third person narrator omniscient. Again, if they're, they predominantly use he, she, they, it, they're not a character in the story and they report the thoughts and of, or feelings of all or most of the characters. That would be called an omniscient third-person narrator. A limited third-person narrator predominantly uses he, she, or it, is not a character in the story, but reports the thoughts and feelings of only one character. So they're limited to that one character. And an objective third-person narrator same category, same factors, predominantly uses he, she, they, it, is not a character in the story, and they do not report on any character's thoughts or feelings. Now, the one other thing you might modify is whether or not the narrator is intrusive, and that can be an omniscient, limited, or objective narrator. That's a narrator that, again, fulfills all the characteristics of the third person narrator, but they also sometimes use the first person and they express opinions about the characters or the stories. So let's take a break, a few seconds, pause if you need a longer break, and then we'll go on to apply these ideas. Let's look first at Sonny's Blues by James Baldwin. So what kind of narrator do we have in Sonny's Blues? Well, it's obviously a first-person narrator because he speaks from his perspective and is a part of the story. So a few quotations to support my interpretation here. I read about it in the paper. I walked from the subway station. I asked her to drink to take drinks to the bandstand. So this is all speaking from the first person and talking about what they're doing in the story. In terms of their reliability, I would say this is a reliable narrator. Obviously, he doesn't know what's going on in Sonny's mind, but I don't get the sense that he's lying to us or trying to keep things from us. And why? Well, he clearly cares for Sonny and other people. He's self-reflective. We see him criticizing himself. For example, when he talks about feeling like a bastard for taking so long to reply to Sonny. Uh, 
Um, and he learns and transforms as a character. So this leads me to believe he's a reliable first person. And really, there's nothing to signal that he's unreliable. So sort of by default, I say we can trust what he's saying is true from his perspective. Now, let's think about the meaning of this narrator. Why in first person? Why not in third person? Let's imagine that the story were told in third person. Uh, it could still be limited, right? It could still limit it to the older brother's perspective, could still keep Sonny's thoughts hidden, which is part of the this character's journey, that he doesn't know what his brother's thinking. But we'd probably have to give the, the narrator a name or the older brother a name. In the story as it's told, we never know his name. And that could mimic the narrator's feeling of distance from from his brother. And we could also organize the plot in the same manner. So you could tell a similar story from third person. But let's think about what you would lose. So let's think about what you would lose. Blah. What are the story's themes? This story is in a big way about alienation and about overcoming that alienation to reconcile between brothers and within a family, to heal a, a broken family. And the concept of brotherhood, which I've put in quotations here because it's not just literal biological brotherhood, but the metaphorical family of humanity, the com community that we're all a part of, is also a, an important theme in this story. And the, the question about what our responsibilities are to each other, what do we owe our fellow human beings? These are all important ideas that the story deals with. So the first person perspective, it encourages us, even though it's saying I, 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 it encourages us to identify with the narrator because we see everything through his eyes. And the fact that the narrator is unnamed allows us to kind of put ourselves in, in his place. It encourages us, I think, to imagine ourselves in his same place. So that's one of the things that the first person narrator does, it encourages us to identify with him and his journey his alienation from his brother and his desire to reconnect. And in doing so, it encourages us to examine our own failures, to care for other people and the relationships that we have with those around us. What do we ignore in the sufferings of those around us because it's too hard for us, because we don't have time? What have we failed to do? What, how have we failed to help others when they're in need? How have we failed to care for our brothers in the way the narrator has abandoned or uh, feels like he had abandoned his brother Sonny. And the way the story is told, the non-chronological order, it is a realistic progress of memory. It really models the way the human mind searches for understanding from the initial shock of reading the story about his brother to then recalling his past relationship with Sonny trying to find an understanding, trying to find some reason for why their lives had turned out the way they had, searching through his past, searching through his family's past, and then to come back to the present to try to engage with his brother. It's a very realistic uh, and, again, personal, emotional, human progress of meaning that would seem perhaps a bit arbitrary if it were written from the third per person. You could still tell the story in that chronology, but it wouldn't seem as, as uh, meaningful or as personal as it is when it's told from the first person. So we see how this choice of perspective, the choice to tell the story from the first person, which is a formal feature, it's a feature of the structure of the story, that embodies and expresses the meaning of the story, the content. The meaning is about, the story is about a person trying to reconcile and understand his brother. And so by telling it through that first perspective, we experience that journey. We experience that story in a more direct way. So the form works with the reader in a particular fashion to create the story. Let's take a break. Pause if you need a little bit longer. 
Let's move on to part three, The Jewelry by Guy de Maupassant. So you've probably already watched my video on the plot of The Jewelry, so we know a lot of these details. But let's review. What's the narrator? What kind of a narrator? Well, it's a third-person narrator because they're not a character in the story, and they only speak in the third person. They're always referring to he or she or they. She was the daughter of blah, blah, blah. Everybody sang her praises. She would, he, he would then smile. So there's no personal perspective in the story. And it's a limited third person perspective. Why? Because we only get the thoughts and feelings of Lantern. We hear what's going on inside of him. He was unutterably happy. He felt shocked by this love of tinsel and show. His despair was so frightful. He was feeling a little ashamed. A horrible suspicion swept across his mind. All these are examples of us seeing the inside of Lantern's mind or his being. We never get the inner thoughts of the wife or any of the other characters, nor do we ever get from the narrator what the wife was doing. So we are limited, even though it's a third person narrator, we're limited to Lanton's perspective. So again, let's ask ourselves, why this particular choice? Why third person limited? Why not objective or omniscient? Or why not first person? So let's examine what the narrator does, what this particular perspective does in terms of creating the story and how a different perspective might not be as effective. So the third person limited perspective, I think encourages us at first to identify and sympathize with Lanton. We can sympathize with him because we can see how he's feeling. We can see that he really was feeling terribly sad when his wife died. He really did love her a great deal, right? That's what the narrator tells us. We have no reason not to believe that. So we can sympathize with him from a distance at the beginning of the story. But it maintains a certain distance, that third person limited, right? It's not... I felt so sad when my wife died, it's he felt sad. So when he becomes greedy at the end of the story, that distance, I think, allows us to still be able to judge him a little bit. We can look back and say, oh, well, he was such a nice guy, but look at how he's changed. And because we're looking at him from the outside, we can judge him and feel a little superior to him when he becomes kind of a jerk at the end of the story. Now, interestingly, the third person limited perspective also keeps us ignorant of his wife's actions, as I mentioned before. Doesn't tell us what his wife is doing, how she got the jewelry, so like him, we are ignorant of what's really going on. So when he learns that the jewelry is real and suspects that she may have been unfaithful, we can identify with his shock. Again, it encourages us to identify with his experience. And at the same time, the third person limited perspective gives us enough clues. And especially once we learn that the jewelry is real, if we go back and read the first half of the story, we see a lot of clues that hmm, maybe there was something else going on here. Maybe this woman wasn't quite as honest and faithful as she appeared. So that, in a sense, provokes us. We're like him, but can we see what he missed? Can we see the evidence that maybe his wife was unfaithful, the evidence that he didn't see? So by never revealing the answer to us or to him, he suspects that his wife has done something, but never tells us that he believes it and never tells us exactly what it is he, he believes, although we can guess. And we never fully know. It puts us in a similar position of never really knowing, never being sure what happened. We can guess what probably happened. She probably got the jewelry from a lover or an admirer with wealth, but we don't know for sure if that happened. So we can never really know what happened. So I'm saying that, you know, even though we are put a little distance between us and Lantern and that we can see some of the evidence that he may be missed, like him, we're also ultimately ignorant of the final truth. So 
it encourages a certain ironic detachment from Lanton. Again, we can identify with him to a degree, but we also judge him for his foolishness and his greed. But that irony is in turn turned back on us. Are we really any, any smarter than him? Again, most of us probably did not see the hints that she was unfaithful or she might be unfaithful until Lanton made the realization himself. So are we really any smarter than him? Would we behave any better in his situation? And finally, what do our assumptions about the wife reveal about our preconceptions and stereotypes? The fact that we imagine that she must have been unfaithful in order to get this and that we perhaps judge her negatively for being unfaithful. What does that say about how we think about women, their proper roles, our preconceptions about where a woman with money could have gotten that money from, and our attitudes towards women and their pursuits of money. What does this say about our own stereotypes related to gender? So it encourages a self-reflection. Now, if we had a first-person perspective, this was told from the first person, There'd be the similar perspective of ignorance towards the wife. Obviously, if this was Lanton telling his story, similarly, he wouldn't know what happened. And we, as the readers, would would experience his ignorance. But it would lose that double-edged irony where we both identify with him and judge him, but also identify or also have to turn that judgment back on ourselves. So the first person perspective, I think, wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to maintain the necessary distance to judge him or to then be critical of our own assumptions. And finally, I think his transformation might not be believable from within. Watching from the outside, we see his sudden shift from depressed to money-hungry, greedy, wealthy man. Um, and even though it seems extreme, I think we can believe it. But it'd be much harder to tell this story from the inside and make it believable, in my opinion. And if it were objective or omniscient, well, again, if it were objective, we would lose that double-edged irony of identification with and judgment of L Lanton, right? We wouldn't see his despair. We wouldn't see his great love. And we wouldn't know that he really did care for this woman and it really did break his heart when she died. Um, so we wouldn't have that ability to identify with him as closely. And if it were omniscient, well, we would just lose the whole mystery and we'd lose that transformation uh, at the heart of the story when Lanton learns or suspends to suspect his wife. So that's why I think the third person limited provides that perfect balance of identification and distance and allows us again to judge Lanton, but also turn our critical eyes back on ourselves. Okay, let's take another break before we look at the Carter stories. Now, The Werewolf and the Company of Wolves, Part 4, Angela Carter's two red, Little Red Riding Hood uh, fairy tale retellings. Now, first off, let's note that what these stories are doing is really challenging the categories that we divide narrators into traditionally. And it does so by playing with the narrator's position relative to the story, and by extension, that plays with our position relative to the story. Both stories use a third person narrative, right? They're predominantly talking in third person, he, she, they, it, and the narrator's not part of the story. So some quotes, they have cold weather. The child had a scabby coat. It is midwinter. He went through the undergrowth. So descriptions of the place from the outside. Now in the werewolf, the third person narrator, I would say is objective. Although one could make an argument for a limited narrator. Uh, and that's because it's almost purely descriptive, almost purely like a camera lens, just looking at things, does give us some history of the place, but there's almost no sense of the inner thoughts or feelings of the characters, which we learn, of course, 
that perhaps they don't really have much in the way of inner feelings. Uh, in the very first lines, they have cold hearts. Now, the reason why I say one might consider it limited is that there are a few moments when it says she knew or they knew. For example, she knew that the wolf was coming for her. They knew that the, the wart was uh, the witch's nipple, etc., etc. So one could say there is some access to the inner lives, but I would argue that predominantly this is an objective narrator that exists purely on the outside of these characters. But it's a intrusive third person objective narrator because they do occasionally use the first person and speak directly to the reader. For example, when they say to these upland woodsmen, the devil is as real as you or I. So even though they're a third person outside of the story, they use that occasional first person to intrude on the world of the narrative. And they also imply a certain ironic, almost sarcastic attitude towards the characters in the story. So the narrator seems to have an opinion when they're talking about their, uh, how they discover witches. One of the ways they discover witches is another old woman whose black cat, oh, sinister, follows her about all the time. That interjection of, oh, sinister, and the, the way the follows her about all the time is italicized as if to emphasize it seems to me to suggest a certain irony. Look at these ridiculous tiny little details that the people get so worked up about. They're so supernatural. They think this makes the woman a witch. So this is an intrusive narrator. Now let's look at the company of wolves. Again, it's a third-person narrator because they predominantly speak in the third person, and they're not a part of the story, right? They're not a character in the story, but this narrator is a part of the story world. A couple of lines where they mention there was a hunter once near here, not so very long ago, a young woman in our village. So whereas the narrator in The Werewolf was, like us, totally on the outside of the world, this narrator is inside the world, even though they're not part of the story. So again, complicating the categories that we think about narrators in. Third person, not part of the story, but part of the story world. I would say it's a third person limited narrator because they do have some inner knowledge, some knowledge of the girl's inner thoughts and feelings. For example, she has inside her a magic space. She knew she was nobody's meat. So there is some sense that the, the narrator knows what's going on within the girl, within her psychic space. However, I could see an argument that this is an objective narrator because we don't get a lot of inner dialogue. So again, challenging the categories, making it difficult to pin down. Again, also, I would say an intrusive narrator because they frequently speak directly to the characters and the audience and they express opinions about the story. So, for example, you are always in danger in the forest. Fear and flee the wolf, a direct command to the reader. If you ever see a wolf, fear and flee it. And then speaking to the characters, you can hurl your Bible at him and your apron after granny speaking directly to the characters, intruding in their world, and then at the end telling us, see, sweet and sound, she sleeps. So again, directing our eyes, the narrator intrudes on our world and on the world of the characters. Now in both stories, the narrator frequently switches places, frequently crosses over that boundary of third person into the first person. And they do that by omitting the quotation marks that we're used to seeing around dialogue. Just a simple thing, taking out that little textual mark, and all of a sudden the narrator's position is totally changed. And when this happens, there's no separation any longer between the narrator and the character. They become a first person narrator for a moment. And it also means there's no separation between the reader and the character. We as readers become part of the story. So some examples, go and visit grandmother, all the better to see you with. There's nobody here but we too, my darling. What shall I do with my blouse? These are all quotes from 
both stories, and I've eliminated the quotation marks too, so you can see the effect, to remember the effect just by that simple typographical change of taking out the quotation marks, the narrator all of a sudden becomes part of the story itself. And so in the first one, the narrator becomes the mother telling us, the child, to go and visit grandmother. Or the narrator becomes the wolf telling us, the child, all the better to see you with. Now you might ask, why such complex shifting perspectives? Why make it so strange and difficult? Why challenge um, and not fit into the easy categories of first person and third person that we're used to? Let's think about what these stories are both about. The main villain in both stories is the werewolf. And what is a werewolf? Well, it's a hybrid. It's human and animal. It's part human, part animal. It's more than human and more than animal. It's not quite human. It's not quite animal, right? It's this strange being that's in between. And werewolves transform from one to another. They cross over. They are one being and then they're another being. And then they trans transform back. So they cross that boundary. And crossing boundaries, changing identities, I would argue are two of the major themes in this story. We constantly see characters crossing physical and metaphorical boundaries and changing their identities, again, literally and metaphorically. Some examples of those boundaries and transformations, the forest and the city, or the forest and civilization, the wilderness and civilization, a boundary that is often crossed by the girl. The grandma and the wolf, one in the same character, one in the same being in the first story. The human and the wolf, the hunter and the wolf in the second story. The hunter versus the hunted and that reversal of roles that we see. The girl goes from being the hunted to being the hunter in the second story in the company of wolves. And the girl also is transforming her own identity from being a girl into a woman. She begins as a young, naive, innocent girl. She ends the story as the wife of the wolf. And a final border crossing, the boundary between separate bodies, individual bodies, is crossed in sexual union. When two bodies become one, and one crosses over one's physical boundary and connects with the body of another. And this transformation is also a metaphor for reading. The reader's identity is transformed. We occupy the psychic space of the characters whenever we read a story. So by embodying these shifting narrative perspectives, by constantly challenging us to say, are we part of the story or not? Who, which character are we? Which character do I identify with? What's real and what's imagined here? that becomes a sort of metaphor for the act of reading itself and our own inner transformations. It enables us to imagine how we cross from our reality over to a fictional world. And of course, any act of communication is crossing over from one reality into another. We all live in our own individual realities, so we have to be able to imagine and put ourselves in the shoes of someone else. Imagine the world from their perspective. That's a big part of what reading is all about. So ultimately, I think what she's doing is revealing both the power and danger of our imagination. And that reading is something that allows us to unleash the other within, unleash that thing within us that's different from ourselves and perhaps try to understand the world from another perspective to be someone else, to transform, even if only for a moment, before we transform to ourselves. All right, our final break. All right, part five, the ones who walk away from Omelas. So this is a third person narrator, right? Not part of the story, refers to the characters in third person. The people went dancing. They did not use swords. In the room is a child sitting, etc., etc. cetera. 
but a very intrusive third person, frequently uses the first person I, and frequently speaks directly to the reader. I do not know the rules and laws of their society. I wish I could convince you. Perhaps it would be best if you imagined it as your own fancy bids. And it's definitely an objective narrator because they don't report the characters' thoughts or feelings. We don't see what's going on inside the characters, only what they do. And the narrator repeatedly mentions their own ignorance, their ignorance of the characters and their ignorance of the world. For example, in some of the quotations on the last slide, they talked about, I don't know the rules of their world, etc., etc. And as at the very end of the story, the narrator most explicitly says, states their own ignorance. The place they go towards is a place even less imaginable to most of us. I cannot describe it at all, but they seem to know where they are going. So we're, it's an intrusive narrator, but a narrator that does not have access to the inner thoughts, the inner experiences of the characters. Now, why this perspective? Well, first off, let's think about what the story is about. It's a story about a utopia. Omalas is a utopia. It's a perfect place. Now, remember, those of you who were in class, we talked about how the Greek word utopia is a pun. It has two meanings. It means both beautiful place and no place. So a utopia is, of course, an impossible location. There is no such thing as a perfect society, a perfect city, a perfect nation. And it's really unimaginable. Because if we could imagine a perfect society and how it worked, well, then we would just build that perfect society and live in it. So we're talking about a place that is unimaginable, that does not exist, that is, by definition, impossible. But as the story goes on and the narrator says, can you, can you believe this? I know you can't believe it. It's so unimaginable. It's so perfect. It's made real through the inclusion of inequality and suffering. Here's what can make you believe that there's the one child that suffers and their suffering is the basis for the you, Omelan's way of life. So pointing out to us how, well, we can't imagine a way of life in which everyone is, has a perfect life. We can't imagine a way of life without someone suffering, without some form of inequality. Every human government, every human structure necessarily has some kind of inequality in it. So the only way we can really believe in a utopia is if there's a dark side to it. The narrator and the reader, that is us, we're both similarly ignorant and similarly trapped. We can't understand this city, Omalas. We can't imagine how it works, how perfect it is. Nor can we imagine where those who walk away are going. So the narrator is highlighting the limitations of our imaginations and our knowledge. The fact that no matter how smart we may think we are and how perfect the world around us may look, there's always someone suffering. There's always some problem. But what about those ones who walk away? What are they doing? They're trying to imagine something better. They're trying to imagine a world where there isn't inequality. They're trying to imagine a world where there isn't suffering. Maybe it's an impossible world. Maybe it's never going to exist, but we can imagine imagining it. We may not be able to actually imagine what the world would look like, but we can imagine imagining it. We can imagine striving for that world. And we can strive for that world, even if we don't know what it is. So this also highlights the potential of our imaginations. So the narrative perspective, I think, encourages us to reflect on our perceptions of society. What do we ignore around us? What are the things that we let slide? What do we accept as just the way things are because we can't imagine otherwise? What are the faults, the sins, the sufferings that we put up with because we just can't imagine it being a different way. And what do we need to try to imagine differently? What do we have a duty to imagine differently? And what would it really mean to try to imagine something different from our society? How would we walk away from that? 
What would that mean? That, I think, is what the narrative perspective is encouraging us to do in this story. Okay, I lied. One last break. We'll have our last little review, and that'll be it. Okay, wrap up. We reviewed the terms that we've introduced in the previous video, and we went over again the idea that narrators are defined by their knowledge and their relationship to the story, their, their position relative to the story, and how much they know about the characters. And we looked at when and why to use these terms. What, when would you use the term first person narrator? When would you use third person omniscient? When would you use unreliable? When would you use intrusive? And again, it's all about answering the questions, what does the narrator know, and where are they relative to the story? And finally, we after that, we looked at the five stories, and we looked at how the narrative perspective shapes our relationship to the story being told. In each one of those, the particular story being told is inextricable from the way it's told. You couldn't tell Sonny's Blues without it being told from the first person. You couldn't tell the ones who walk away from Omelas without it being told from that particular narrator and her um, intrusive wondering about what's going on in their minds. You couldn't tell the company of wolves or the werewolf without the complex shifting narrators that challenge us to think about what our own perspective is and our own position is relative to the story. So the structure of the story relates directly to the content and the meaning. The meaning is expressed in the structure of the story. And that's, I think, if there's one thing I could get you to take away, it's that the meaning and the form are really two aspects of the same coin. They're two sides of the same coin. And that's it. If you have any questions or comments, you can email me, contact me otherwise, uh, text me. Um, otherwise, I wish you the day you wish yourselves, and I will see you in class or on the next video.